Greetings from LA, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very, very much hope that this video finds you well and in very, very good spirits wherever you are in the world. And today, if you don't mind, I would very much like to continue on with our discussions and our explorations with respect to a very special filmmaker, artist extraordinaire. Uh, his body of work, I think, is boundless. It is filled with a richness of energy and style and panache that can also be described as uh, being uh, quite uh, outlandish, uh, outrageous, over the top, filled with uh, the possibility of controversy and also a sense of excitement and thrill and a roller coaster ride that also has hints of comedy and social commentary uh, while at the same time uh, showcasing, I think, a, a really, uh, a truly inventive, one-of-a-kind uh, approach to a sort of a cinema grammar and storytelling that makes uh, this filmmaker's body of work uh, so memorable and so boundless and timeless, uh, thus to be part of the conversation uh, uh, well after uh, they have been initially released. This is a very special filmmaker indeed. The filmmaker I'm speaking of is the one, the only, Brian De Palma. And so we've been speaking, you and I, about the feature films of Brian De Palma. And we've been talking about the films from the 1960s all the way through the very inventive uh, films of the 1970s. And now we are ushered into that decade of the 80s. And uh, we have started the discussion at the end of the 1970s into the 1980s with our previous film discussion of a film called Home Movies. But now, my dear friends, let us now embark upon a film that could also be said to be truly, boldly, and without, uh, without shame uh, thrusting us, uh, ushering us into this decade of the 1980s. And my gosh, wow, what a film to do this with. This is the film that is released in 1980, and it is written by Brian De Palma and directed by Brian De Palma. And what a film. It is this. Dressed to Kill. So before we speak about some of the plot details and a spoiler discussion, let me now uh, first speak about this film in very general terms, again, for the sake of those, for the benefit of those who have not yet seen this uh, film, this, I think, very Brian De Palma film indeed. I think uh, if there is a, gr a really Brian De Palma, what is an ultimate Brian De Palma film experience? I think Dress to Kill could be a really uh, appropriate answer to that question. This is a film that is a thriller that has some parts film noir, that has some parts uh, silent comedy, that has some parts silent film, that has some parts horror film, that also has some parts of a, uh, a, a, a type of uh, 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 human drama that uh, has the potential of totally uh, shifting the balance and destroying the very foundations uh, that have been very intricately and very, uh, uh, very uh, tightly uh, organized throughout its uh, structure, at least as we become enveloped and introduced into the drama. And so it paves the way for something that can also be said to be a type of myriad puzzle, a labyrinth, if you will, a type of psychological landscape of an interior, say, psychological working or workings, whose, say, uh, output or outcomes or ebbs and flows are made manifest in the exterior cinematic world of Brian De Palma, a la this story, Dressed to Kill. So there's a lot, I would say, uh, that goes on here that makes this oh so a Brian De Palma film experience. It is also very shocking, it's very violent, it is very aggressive, and it uh, no holds barred in terms of the way it depicts violence uh, in cinema, the way it depicts uh, sexuality and the many, say, uh, forms and outputs and perspectives on sexuality and how this uh, this type of uh, perspective or viewpoint, both uh, externally and also self-reflexively, how this uh, can affect uh, the characters that we meet along 
this journey of the running time of Dress to Kill. And I mean that in a very specific way and also mean that in a way that uh, has different meanings to different characters depending on who we are uh, meeting uh, at a given point in time in the film. And so in that type of discussion, we also have a film that we know from, say, uh, some of the supplements that are uh, made available in these great uh, physical media releases, such as the recent Kino Lorber 4K release that I have here, as well as other releases, which I'll get to in a moment. We do know that upon the time of this film's release in 1980, it did... Uh, encounter its fair share of negative criticism and controversy because of these uh, perceived aspects of, of depictions of violence and sexuality which uh, perhaps in the most extreme negative critical example uh, might be interpreted or regarded or otherwise classified as being uh, straddling uh, the line between quote-unquote art and quote-unquote exploitation, or perhaps not even straddling, perhaps uh, very uh, egregiously uh, crossing the boundaries of what might what one might call uh, quote-unquote uh, sensibility and quote-unquote good taste in cinema, whatever that means. And so, uh, but this is also to point out the fact that this is a very complex film. This is a very difficult film in a lot of ways. And so uh, this also has the potential of perhaps uh, inspiring or uh, suggesting or even you know, welcoming uh, this type of critical, uh, critical eye and uh, maybe even a negative, keenly negative critical eye uh, with respect to some of these uh, themes that, again, uh, uh, were perceived and perhaps still are perceived. Uh, as being very, uh, very maybe insensitive and also uh, quite outlandish uh, to the point of being even uh, insulting uh, to certain circles. And I believe that type of reaction is uh, very natural. And I think uh, if one feels that way about this film, uh, Brian De Palma's Dress to Kill, I think that's uh, not an unreasonable approach to have. After all, a Brian De Palma film is not necessarily meant to be liked by everyone. Uh, there will be people who dislike Brian De Palma's films, such as Dress to Kill and perhaps even other films in the Brian De Palma oeuvre. And if that's the case for you, that's a perfectly, I think, uh, reasonable approach to have. After all, your cinema journey is your own. And indeed, from my vantage point, I can definitely, uh, I can definitely understand uh, if there are aspects of uh, Brian De Palma's films, such as Dress, Dress to Kill, that may turn off. Uh, certain viewers uh, from uh, from the viewpoint of, say, some of the discussion points that I've uh, alluded to just now. If that's the case, I think that's a very, very uh, not unreasonable approach to have. For my uh, two cents, I would say, or at least for my subjective viewpoint, I hold this to be a film that, as I say, is very complex. There are parts that are perhaps uh, not as well rendered as others, and there are parts that, yes, indeed, uh, can be understandably regarded as being uh, quite maybe insensitive in a lot of ways. And so I can definitely understand that, and I'll try to explain a little bit more or unpack that a little bit more in the latter half of this video uh, when we talk about the specifics. Uh, but I think also it is possible to for me to view this uh, as the sum uh, total of its parts, and the sum total of its parts is quite uh, quite inventive and very stark and uh, quite startling and indeed in a very hypnotic way, which invites me and which uh, uh, takes me along for this roller coaster ride, the cinematic roller coaster ride with a lot of chills, a lot of thrills, and a lot of bursts of uh, sudden, uh, seemingly random acts of violence. Uh, that really uh, are part of or are populating uh, this Brian De Palma story. So the sum total of its parts is, is one way for me to look at this. Also, it is possible to consider uh, maybe a differing, even uh, seemingly uh, contradictory points about this and still come away with this or walk away with this or, or, or become engaged with this film in a way that I think is uh, still uh, potentially a very meaningful and engaging uh, cinema viewing experience indeed, uh, while also remembering uh, the points that make this, in my view, a tour de force Brian De Palma film, not only in the context of, say, how it's connected with previous Brian De Palma films, such as the Uber of the 1970s, uh, Sisters comes to mind, The Fury comes to mind, Carrie come to mind, comes to mind, etc., 
as well as other films, uh, in the way that style is applied, the way that the camera work and camera movement glides and, and POV shots and tracking shots are applied in a way that is suggestive of a type of psychological uh, portrait or landscape of the characters that we are viewing at that particular moment. Uh, again, the, in, the interior monologue made uh, exterior, made manifest in the exterior of the, the cinematic landscape of De Palma, not only in those terms, but also in the cinematic stylings of the editing, slow motion usage, uh, capturing foreground and background in the same shot in extreme focus points, uh, and also uh, split screen usage, etc. Uh, these uh, cinematic gr uh, grammatical points are used to full force and effect, uh, as we've seen in past De Palma works. But we see also how they are being used and perhaps even manipulated in a way that also is not just hearkening back to what we've seen before, but also paving the way for something that is very new and bold and inventive. Things that we have seen before, but things done in a way too that are fresh and inventive and also uh, very unique uh, to the situation. And in that way, this film is linking back to the past, but also paving the way forward for this decadent and very, uh, very uh, controversial and outrageous uh, decade of cinema uh, from Brian De Palma. Yes, the 1980s. And it begins here, or it can be said to begin here, uh, with this oh-so-Brian De Palma film, which is Dressed to Kill. And not to mention, of course, too, the, I think the, the nuanced and uh, very effective performances, uh, which we'll talk about here, a great cast, uh, Angie Dickinson, Michael Caine, Nancy Allen, uh, Keith Gordon, uh, Dennis Franz, etc., has a, a great cast, a great uh, music, uh, Pino Donaggio score, and uh, it, it is overall, I think, uh, a film that, again, uh, it feels like a Brian De Palma film, it looks like a Brian De Palma film, it acts like a Brian De Palma film, and so if that's the case, hold on tight, hold on to your hats, buckle up, because you're in for quite a ride indeed. It is bumpy, it is it is um, uh, aggressive, it is uh, unforgiving, unrelenting, it might even be shocking, perhaps even might be too shocking for some. Um, it is very controversial, it has been controversial, it perhaps still remains controversial even as the years pass. Perhaps its controversy has not diminished, but perhaps has been augmented over the years, uh, which is something that we'll talk about as well. So, uh, But that is par for the course with uh, Brian De Palma films, is it not? I mean, we've seen the sense of controversy controversy before. And uh, now that we're in the 1980s, uh, there's no looking back. I mean, from this point on, we're going to talk about Brian De Palma, the political incorrectness of, of a lot of the setups and uh, situations and scenarios. Uh, but again, that's par for the course. And also that is, in many ways, what makes a Brian De Palma film a Brian De Palma film. And so uh, in that way, in other ways, I think Dress to Kill is uh, the uh, Brian De Palma film par excellence. Uh, it is one of the supreme examples of the art and style and storytelling mastery of this artist, uh, warts and all. Uh, and so I think as a total package, it is truly a uh, breathtaking and uh, quite a Brian De Palma film experience indeed. So I'm looking forward to speaking about the details of this film, Dress to Kill. Uh, but again, uh, for the benefit of those who have not yet seen this film, Dress to Kill, here you have it. Uh, if you've seen previous Brian De Palma films before and you haven't seen this, if you've liked what you've seen before, especially the horror thriller films, if you've enjoyed those films, then uh, perhaps this film might be one that you will also be engaged with. Uh, please let me know. Uh, if you're not interested in other Brian De Palma films, then maybe this film is not for you. So it is quite graphic in a lot of places. There is a very frank and, and quite direct and uh, very pointed uh, depiction of violence and sexuality in this film. So it might not be for everyone. But again, uh, uh, if you are already into the works of Brian De Palma and you are okay with this type of content, then uh, this may be something that uh, might uh, be engaging for you. Uh, and I just also point out that there's not only this Kino Lorber 4K uh, release from uh, from uh, very recently, but there have also been some past releases as well. Excuse me. Uh, I draw your attention to, for instance, the great Arrow Blu-ray release from some years back and also the Criterion release, uh, Blu-ray release from some years back. So a lot of options in the physical media realm uh, for watching this film uh, from 1980. 
but now going forward, let us now speak about some plot specifics and spoilers. So for those who have not yet seen this film, uh, my strong suggestion is please turn off this video now, and if you're still interested in the discussion, you can always come back to this video. It should still be up in the channel, uh, at which time I'll be very, very interested to hear what it is you have to say about this work from Brian De Palma, which is Dressed to Kill. Okay, so you're back, which means it's okay to speak to you about some specifics of this work, Dressed to Kill. So where do we begin? Uh, I suppose... One way to look at this is, again, my my real earnest feeling about this film, that it is in many ways one of the most Brian De Palma-esque films in the Brian De Palma canon. And so what do I mean by this? I, I think there is a way in which it feels like a film that could be read as a, a, a exploitation film that could be read as a quote-unquote type of, of film that is um, uh, uh, that is flirting with uh, the periphery of, say, cinema sleaze, or it could be said to be uh, fiddling with or experimenting with uh, a type of uh, a genre cinema that is uh, sort of probing the extremities, as it were. Uh, and it could be said to be the those uh, it could be said to be described in those terms perhaps in a negative light, but I think what's so amazing about Brian De Palma's works overall and Dress to Kill is a great example of this is that it seems to be welcoming that negative criticism and it also seems to be suggesting or welcoming the conversation that perhaps that negative criticism can itself be used as a type of strength of this film in a sort of circular fashion, which allows for I think. Uh, a, a possibility, a myriad of interpretations to occur even within the same, say, mode of, of controversial uh, discussion uh, a la a film like Dress to Kill. Case in point, for example, the opening of this film or the way in which we are introduced to our one of our main characters, uh, the character of uh, Kate, Kate Miller, who is portrayed by Andy, Dick, Andy Dickinson, excuse me, a brilliant performance, by the way, from Andy Dickinson. Uh, which is also uh, uh, one of the uh, great strengths of Brian De Palma's works, which might not always be as stressed um, in the conversations as others, namely that Brian De Palma really brings out great performances from his actors uh, all the way through. We've seen it in the 1960s and 1970s with his work with great actors such as uh, Margot Kidder and C.C. Spacek and um, uh, William Finley and Amy Irving and uh, John Cassavetes and Robert De Niro, etc. Uh, Charles Durning, etc. It's been, uh, what a great Jennifer Salt. It's been a great, great run uh, well, with working with those and other actors, giving great performances. Uh, Nancy Allen, John Travolta, etc. And so now uh, in a film like uh, Dress to Kill, uh, we see that tradition of great performances from actors in Brian De Palma films, I think, across the board. And so Angie Dickinson already carrying this film, leading uh, this film, at least the first part of it anyway, because we know what will happen to her character around uh, some, maybe, uh, by the end of the what one might call the first act or first arc of this film. But uh, yes, needless to say, she does make a strong and quite memorable, unforgettable entrance in this film in terms of the glide of the camera and the shower sequence and the uh, quite frank displays of nudity and a type of sexual uh, uh, fantasy uh, which uh, has its uh, quite bold and daring and uh, quite provocative close-ups uh, on the naked human body which we understand too are close-ups of body doubles, uh, and uh, uh, which uh, is also uh, populated or illustrated or perhaps augmented by the wonderfully over-the-top uh, score by Pino Donaggio, which has this alluring nature to it that is then uh, punctuated with the oohs and ahs uh, that almost call attention to the fact that this is uh, could be said to be almost like a parody or self-parody upon itself. After all, we get the uh, the almost uh, uh, saccharine or uh, 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 almost a, a syrupy type of of a way in which this uh, uh, sexual fantasy is constructed, and it might be seen to be straddling the line of exploitation, uh, seeming uh, that we have uh, the naked body uh, of a woman 
which seems to be the, uh, the, the point of fixation of the camera as a type of exploitation vehicle. Uh, but also keep in mind too, again, these points of self-parody, the fact that it seems almost too quote-unquote uh, perfect to be true, end quote. And uh, also recall that this fantasy is uh, could be said to be from the viewpoint of our main character, Kate Miller herself. And so uh, we then, uh, later on, we understand that this becomes uh, our way of understanding that Kate as a character is very sexually frustrated in her relationship with uh, this man who is also part of this fantasy, seemingly there but also distant, with uh, Razor in hand, which uh, is a really quite chilling bit of foreshadowing if ever there was one. Uh, but uh, here the point is, I think this is a great example of what I was trying to allude to earlier, that Negative criticism uh, is something that I think this film welcomes and invites, but also allows us to uh, suggest or, or perhaps uh, query as to the possibility of interpreting this film in a myriad of ways, different ways, even contradictory ways, even uh, at the same time. And so uh, in this example, we have uh, something that could be seen to be uh, uh, sexually explicit and perhaps too over the top, politically incorrect, and uh, maybe straddling or exceeding the lines of quote unquote good taste and entering in the, into the realm of exploitation. That's certainly a possible interpretation. Uh, but it also could be seen to be self reflexive because we understand the points of parody and self parody that might be calling attention to itself. It might be uh, encouraging us to laugh along with the film to uh, remind us of just how ludicrous and over the top this is and thus allowing for a type of dialogue uh, with the uh, the camera and with the, between the film and the audience, namely uh, perhaps suggesting that this is something that is too syrupy sweet, something that therefore is uh, truly meant to be treated as a type of uh, glacial, artificial, uh, or cinematic artifice. And if that's the case, then what we are going to be seeing from here on in could also be said to be part of the cinematic artifice done in maybe a tongue-in-cheek and maybe even a comedic or, or over-the-top outlandish way, but tongue-in-cheek and uh, self-reflexive all the same. And if that's the case, then uh, we have to wonder just how little or how much uh, in control our main character is. I mean, depending on what viewpoint we have, uh, we might interpret the main character of K to be uh, uh, completely lacking in control of her own destiny and her own uh, will and decision-making, or she might be totally in control of her own will and her own, uh, say, decision-making. Uh, and I think either possibility is extremely extreme to the other, but uh, I think both form uh, potentially uh, interesting readings of the film, thus creating this sense of multiple interpretations at once, a myriad uh, interpretations, even seemingly contradictory interpretations at once. Also, making it even more complicated is the fact that this is a film that is being made by uh, the, sort of the, the the male perspective of Brian De Palma. I think uh, if you see Brian De Palma interviews, uh, you'll recognize that he is, I think, uh, very much acknowledging uh, the male gaze, the male perspective that he is uh, uh, bringing on or perhaps intruding upon the scene. Uh, but uh, that is uh, that for him is his perspective. And so I think that also adds an extra layer of possible interpretation, either one way or another. Uh, this is a great example, therefore, of what we uh, what we will be confronted with as we go along with the uh, the hijinks and the uh, violence and the roller coaster thrills that is uh, this film Dress to Kill. Then we go along with the film, and I think uh, we should be reminded of I think how this film really takes some fundamentally bold steps. Two of them, I would say, at least two as we go and progress into this part of the film that could be described as Kate's story, the Angie Dickinson character story. So two very fundamentally bold occurrences occur right after this. Uh, well, first of all, we do see the juxtaposition between the quote-unquote sexual fantasy of the shower scene on the one hand, and then the the rude awakening of the um, the obligatory uh, uh, frolic in bed, as it were, uh, and we see perhaps uh, Kate uh, feigning or pretending to be uh, uh, in the throes of a type of uh, orgasmic delight, but uh, 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 things uh, are not what they seem in the world of De Palma, and you know, we also therefore understand uh, that. 
she is very much uh, frustrated and uh, having a kind of a lack of satisfaction in her love life uh, with uh, uh, this person, her partner. And so this brings us to one of the two fundamental points that follows this, namely her conversation, her scene with uh, the uh, Michael Caine character, Dr. Elliot. And uh, we see a, fil a scene that from one perspective could be uh, centralized upon the Kate character herself, but upon rewatch we also come to understand that Dr. Elliot's character is one of the most crucial and critical characters of this film, Dress to Kill, and we'll talk a little bit about why in a moment, but uh, needless to say that upon rewatch, or perhaps for those who are watching it for the first time but have a very keen sense of, of uh, observation, one might notice little clues or hints along the way in the scene that suggest that maybe Dr. Elliot uh, might be uh, positioning himself in a way that uh, could be potentially overly intrusive. Uh, look at the way in which he looks uh, looks at himself in the mirror upon certain suggestions of of uh, 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 questioning whether or not he is attracted sexually to Kate Miller or not. Or look at the way in his body language, how he moves and shuffles his feet and crosses his legs uh, at uh, some points of the sexually charged conversation, etc. We are still in the type of uh, uh, afterglow or residue of these initial scenes that we saw opening the film that focused on Kate from her uh, uh, vantage point as a, as a, and, and her, say, um, uh, 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 maybe sexual-based fantasies or appetites or uh, th uh, suggestions of uh, lack of satisfaction uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of this aspect of her her life and uh, her uh, say daily life as it were. So uh, in that way, we can still see the Dr. Elliot scene as being Kate centric. But again, uh, in the world of Brian De Palma, nothing is as it seems, and perhaps what we are seeing also is uh, the indications of things to come, especially when we understand how important and integral Michael Caine's character will be, or in fact is, uh, at these moments of the film. But we haven't finished with the Kate character yet, with Angie Dickinson's character yet, because we have yet the second uh, fundamental part of this, which is the famous museum set piece. Um, this is a film that's uh, uh, supposed to be set in New York, although we understand from some of the supplemental materials that this part, this museum piece, was uh, shot uh, in Philadelphia. But uh, needless to say, uh, it is one of the most celebrated sequences in Brian De Palma's filmography, I think for great reason. It is one of the greatest sequences in this film and indeed uh, the Brian De Palma filmography writ large. This sequence is masterful. Uh, it is almost completely silent uh, in terms of uh, lack, uh, not having dialogue, not depending on dialogue for the most part. Uh, it is uh, focusing in on looks and uh, uh, action and reaction. A character is seen looking, and then we also see a shot of what the character is looking at and then looking back at a type of reaction. This is very... Um, this is very much a type of uh, exercise in montage and editing. But this is also uh, maybe utilizing techniques which I think have been celebrated and uh, perhaps um, most celebrated, say, in the hands of uh, filmmakers like Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, the lines to also suggest uh, frames within frames, uh, perhaps even uh, the people that uh, Kate is watching, eavesdropping, uh, uh, acting as a type of voyeur herself, uh, maybe looking at other scenes, people in the museum, uh, couples that might be flirt, uh, overly flirtatious in the public setting, other uh, people that are families uh, uh, the, the, with children running off, etc. Uh, these might be uh, uh, random acts of voyeurism on the part of Kate, but they also could be suggestive of maybe some kind of ex uh, extension of the fantasies uh, that she might be visualizing or she might be projecting onto the people that she sees. Again, frames within frames. Through each frame, there might be a different form of an alternate fantasy from the point of view of Kate, who then, when we return to her, we see a type of uh, writing in the diary, uh, must buy a turkey or buy nuts, etc., almost a reminder of the quote-unquote mundane boring uh, experience or life that uh, Tate seems to be having again uh, if any uh, if the indication of the splicing between the quote unquote se uh, sexual fantasy shower at the beginning and then the rude awakening of the sex in bed uh, that opens the the film is any indication so uh, I think it's a very or 
it's a very dynamic and bold setup for the museum set piece and it hasn't even gotten underway yet because it begins to get underway at least from almost an action set piece point of view when we have the introduction of this strange man uh, complete with uh, over the top uh, wonderfully outlandish sunglasses and uh, hairstyle and the, the look uh, all the way down with the pen that he uh, occasionally uh, puts in his mouth and looking upon the art on the wall uh, perhaps he is uh, showing actual uh, interest in the art or maybe just pretending who knows but this begins the cat and mouse chase uh, that is again mostly silent but there's a lot of action through corridors through rooms a glove becomes uh, accidentally misplaced or forgotten about which is also an indication a great indication of Kate's character she tends to be somewhat forgetful which will become a very key critical plot point which will bring uh, what happens to her in motion a little bit later on in the film. Uh, but we get a little uh, uh, idea of this and her forgetfulness with one glove. Uh, she takes it off to reveal her ring as well, which then she interprets uh, as being a type of turnoff because at that point the man seems to be leaving her and that uh, is maybe intriguing her, making her curious, wanting her to pursue him. And then uh, failing that, or then she becomes the pursuit. So which is the cat, which is the mouse in this cat and mouse chase? Sometimes the roles become reversed. Sometimes uh, she feels threatened. Sometimes she feels uh, turned off, repulsed even. But then she feels curious, uh, inviting this type of danger, this type of, of uh, flirting with infidelity, uh, which has hitherto been... Uh, merely a fantasy, but will the fantasy become uh, manifest into a sense of reality? Will the inner workings of her psych psychology become manifest in the exterior world of the Brian De Palma cinema? Will she indeed penetrate that hitherto two-dimensional screen, that two-dimensional frame, which has been uh, separate from her even when she's been sitting alone, aloof on the bench at the very start of this uh, sequence where she's been gazing out uh, as a voyeur in, in other uh, possible alternate frames frames of, uh, of fantasy. Well, when she crosses that threshold, once she crosses that threshold, uh, she crosses the point of no return because, uh, I mean, she has no way of knowing it now, but once she crosses that threshold and when she enters into this realm and this world of, of uh, not just flirtation with this man, but actually uh, a one-night stand with this man, when she crosses that threshold, it's the point of no return, and she has no way of knowing, but it will lead to her doom. Uh, but, uh, my goodness, the, the, the process of getting there and the flourishes that uh, accompany that journey, that downward smile, that journey towards the unknown and death, it is quite a Brian De Palma roller coaster indeed, uh, all the way down to, again, the bravura camera work, the, the heightened crescendos of the Donaggio score. Uh, and I think what's uh, so great about uh, the, well, one of the great things about this uh, truly uh, masterful sequence, it's mentioned, for instance, in the Kino Lorber uh, release audio commentary track by um, uh, Maitland McDonough about how this is a bravura sequence, uh, and it's a tour de force sequence that is not just a show of style only, but in fact this is meant to further augment the characterization of Kate herself. After all, this is something about showing her pursuing and being pursued. It's also showing her trying to actualize or flirting with the actualization of a fantasy that she has been having. Uh, but will it come to fruition or not? And it is showing through, again, within the cinema grammar of Brian De Palma. The inner workings of the character, the inner psychologies of the character are made manifest in the exterior cinema grammar of uh, Brian De Palma. And so this becomes a stylistic tour de force that is also driving the character to its a type of inexorable conclusion. At this point, the, that conclusion being the final sort of confrontation uh, and the union in the taxi cab outside, not to mention a little glimpse of Bobby, uh, who will become a very prominent character uh, as we progress through this uh, journey into the abyss for Kate. But a little glimpse of Bobby outside the museum, the other glove being thrown and then picked up uh, by this character we understand to be Bobby. But uh, forget that for the time being because we're in the taxi and my goodness uh, uh, talk about uh, sexual innuendo uh, very much uh, a type of um, 
uh, sexual expression that uh, is, uh, shall we say, uh, very direct, very, uh, uh, you know, it, it's very much like Brian De Palma cinema, you know, it's very indirect, very in-your-face type of, of, uh, of uh, uh, approach to uh, uh, sort of this aggressive uh, storytelling. Uh, and uh, this sexual encounter in the taxi is uh, is quite a quite a memorable one indeed, uh, let alone for the taxi driver. I should point out too that uh, the um, the uh, there's a great Hitchcockian moment here where the scream, the the uh, ecstatic um, uh, uh, um, the ecstatic um, uh, 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 orgasmic scream of Kate. Uh, is then blended over into the sound of a New York car horn traffic sound, which I think is a really great Hitchcockian touch. It reminds me of some uh, similar moments like uh, in the earlier sound films of Alfred Hitchcock, like 39 Steps or a film like Young and Innocent, where he had, say, the discovery of a dead body early on in the film. And just as the body's been discovered, the people who discovered scream, but then the scream is then blended over into, say, the sound of a seagull or the sound of a train whistle or something like that. So I like that Hitchcockian touch of uh, things that are uh, meant to mimic or recall the sound of a scream. In this case, uh, a scream or sound of, of uh, 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 orgasmic joy and ecstasy. Uh, but uh, this leads to the uh, encounter uh, in the apartment and uh, after some time has passed, uh, she, he is sleeping in bed, she wakes up and she has to get ready to leave uh, with a little bit of a, a, a reference back to the home. She calls but doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't say anything when uh, he answers the, the other line. Uh, and also there's a, another moment of the forgetfulness of Kate. There's a moment where she's trying to find her underpants. She can't remember where it was, but then uh, the cinema of Brian De Palma reminds us that the, the pants were dropped on the floor of the taxi. Uh, so much like the glove, uh, she forgets uh, this other article of clothing. She will forget something else as well uh, very soon after this. That's the ring, uh, which will again be one of the last steps uh, towards her journey into doom and death, uh, of course. But it, it's another sign of forgetfulness. But again, this forgetfulness. Uh, is a very key plot point, and it's also I, I love the way it's it's expressed in a type of split screen manner. Uh, Kate's face on one side of the the wide screen, and what she's thinking about is on the other side of the screen. Uh, Brian De Palma utilizing the split screen in a very interesting way here. Uh, action and reaction. Uh, the interior monologue get made externalized or made manifest through external uh, uh, cinematic technique. Uh, so very Brian De Palma. And uh, not only do we see her flirting with uh, the sort of the leaving the note behind, but also the sudden and shocking revelation that uh, this man that she has slept with has indeed uh, been notified by uh, the State Department of Health that he has contracted a venereal disease. And to add insult to injury, not only has he contracted a venereal disease, but the note or the notice indicates, the health notice indicates that he has contracted a venereal disease, exclamation point. So to add insult to injury, the explanation point seals the deal. The shock and doom and horror that comes over Kate's face, this extreme close-up on her face, is, is a, a truly extraordinary acting moment. And it's, it's also uh, shocking. It's also the heights of melodrama. Again, we're reminded of the oohs and ahs of the Donaggio score that opened with the shower sequence. It's almost uh, so over the top, so outlandish, so ludicrous. And I think here, the icing on the proverbial cake of shock and horror and awe is the exclamation point. And so it, it, it's, again, straddling the line of, of shock and horror, but also it's uh, uh, also perhaps blending that with a sense of self-parody. Uh, so we're very much in a kind of realm of, uh, of uh, tongue-in-cheek Brian De Palma, almost uh, uh, dark humor. Uh, that also is... Uh, uh, entering the realm or discussion of uh, venereal disease, of um, you know, uh, promiscuity, of uh, unprotected sex. And so these become, I think, uh, very interesting points of discussion and we'll, uh, that'll be part of the discussion later on because this film will open up and gather uh, these, I think, very direct and very uh, quite uh, 
quite startlingly direct uh, points of conversation when it comes to human sexuality. And we'll talk a little bit about that and how that might be seen in terms of maybe uh, the negative critical light that I was alluding to early on in the discussion uh, with respect especially to uh, the Bobby character. Uh, but uh, before we get to that, of course, we have to get to one of uh, another one of the most famous or infamous scenes in this film, and indeed uh, one of the most infamous scenes in all of Brian De Palma's filmography, and that is the uh, elevator murder scene. And this is one of the most shocking scenes, really, really shocking scene. I remember seeing this film for the first time on VHS tape many, many years ago. Uh, this film's uh, murder scene is etched in my mind. I've been traumatized to no end uh, by this scene. It is brutal, it is violent, it is bloody. I think the line across the, the palm of her hand by the razor blade is is truly ghoulish and terrifying stuff. And uh, augmented by the, the uh, almost oppressive uh, uh, Donaggio score, and of course the towering, uh, uh, frightening figure of the, the murderer. Now this person dressed in black with the, uh, with the, the hair, the blonde hair, and then just, uh, you know, in this type of, uh, uh, this type of uh, uh, setup or standing. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of nervous already just thinking about it. I'm, I, I'm, I'm fidgety all over. So uh, it is really a traumatizing experience to have watched that for the first time many, many years ago. And that trauma has not left me. And I dare say it probably will, will stay with me to the day that I die. Uh, hopefully my death won't be in an elevator a la Kate in Dress to Kill, I hope. But uh, the point being is that this is one thoroughly brutal and uh, uh, unforgettable sequence. It is one of the greatest sequences, one of the most unforgettable sequences in this film and all of Brian De Palma's cinema. So already, when you remember the museum set piece and now the elevator murder sequence, or do we have two sequences that arguably are among the very best Brian De Palma has ever done? So, and they're all in this film, and we're not even done yet with this. So, uh, that is, if any indication, that is, I think, a wonderful uh, indication of just how Brian De Palma this Brian De Palma film is. And it also is a great way of introducing not just the figure of the murderer, but also and also the gruesome death of the character that we have come to know and, and understand to be our main character, at least up to this point. Uh, but uh, oft in a very cruel way, all the way down to the, the smashing of her wrist by the elevator door. At the very, that is a very cruel uh, point indeed. But it also is handing the baton off to our main character now going forward, or one of the main characters now going forward, that is the Nancy Allen character. Now I've mentioned again before about how great uh, Brian De Palma film performances are, and here's another great exception. Nancy Allen is superb in this film. Recall how her character was uh, uh, represented and how she portrayed the character in the film Carrie, and now look at her. The, 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 the difference is amazing. And uh, there is a sort of self-assuredness about her character here. Um, there is a, a matter-of-factness, which I think is very uh, refreshing. She's talking about uh, stocks and investment and personal finances, which is also very interesting. She's also uh, very vulnerable as well, uh, and uh, she also approaches her own uh, sexuality in a way that uh, could be said to be uh, exuding or, a, or suggestive of a, uh, a, a mode of confidence, which I think is also a very interesting uh, contrast to other characters in this film, such as the Kate character, uh, Angie Dickinson's character. But uh, here we have the introduction of one of our new, uh, one of the other main characters of this. Uh, and my goodness, what an introduction this is. And it'll also bring about the introduction of, or we've already met too, and I forgot to mention this, but we've already met the other uh, main character of Keith Gordon, the son, and uh, who is uh, going to also play a very prominent role. And uh, the uh, they will join forces in trying to solve the mystery of the killing of his mother, uh, Angie Dickinson's character, and who is the this uh, mysterious uh, figure in black. Well, uh, their mystery, uh, their uh, investigation leads them to a number of places, uh, one of which, of course, being uh, encountering the Michael Caine character, Dr. Elliot. And here is where we're going to have to talk about the great performance and of Michael Caine 
and also the way in which the Dr. Elliot Bobby character or characters is or are de uh, depicted in this film. And it's one of the most intriguing, perhaps one of the most controversial, and uh, one of the most uh, integral and important aspects of this film. Again, for better or for worse, uh, like it or not, uh, this is uh, one of the key points of this film, Dress to Kill. And uh, for uh, for some, it's a maybe make or break moment. And I'm speaking, of course, of, of uh, how uh, uh, Bobby's character is portrayed uh, and uh, the, the, the fact that uh, Bobby is uh, this uh, very dangerous killer uh, who is uh, very evidently uh, quite uh, mentally disturbed for uh, one reason or another, and how uh, Bobby's actions and the perception of being mentally disturbed seem also in the hands or in the context of the film Dressed to Kill seem also to be, uh, unfortunately, uh, seem to be uh, interpreted as having a connection with uh, 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 Bobby's sexuality, uh, 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 the transsexual nature of the character, and leading to uh, sort of accusations of transphobia uh, on the part of uh, Brian De Palma and Dress to Kill. And I believe that that type of, of uh, uh, say, negative critical aspect of this film is not unfounded, or it's not something that is unreasonable. I mean, after all, there is a very frank uh, discussion of, uh, for instance, um, uh, um, gender reassignment surgery at the end of the film or near the end of the film between Keith Gordon's character and Nancy Allen's character, which seems to be suggesting, uh, in terms of where it's placed in the film, that it has a direct relationship with the psychosis of uh, Bobby slash Dr. Elliot and the and quote unquote the, maybe it therefore uh, by virtue of its montage based positioning in terms of its editing might have some kind of implication as to uh, the reasoning or the the psychology or the mo behind why Bobby did what Bobby did and so if that's the case then uh, that may lead uh, some people to regard uh, that aspect of the film as having uh, um, unfortunate elements of trans uh, transphobia, and so uh, this is uh, something that is uh, has not gone away, uh, but in fact it's still part of the conversation when uh, considering uh, Dress to Kill. And there are other aspects of this film too that might be considered to be uh, somewhat uh, unfortunately depicted. And I draw your attention to one of the other great sequences of the film, that being the train cars chase sequence uh, between Nancy Allen's character and the, the Bobby character, uh, but it also involves early on in that sequence uh, her interaction uh, with some youths uh, on the platform, which could be said to, said to be, uh, again, if one dons a negatively critical uh, uh, view of that particular sequence, could be said to be uh, quite racially insensitive. And so I think these uh, invite us to consider certain components or parts of this film to be maybe subpar to some, maybe uh, lacking in a type of uh, a necess necessary sensitivity. Uh, again, uh, aspects that could be deemed to be uh, negative in terms of a critical consequence. And if you feel that way about these components, I think that's, again, a very reasonable and legitimate uh, perspective to, uh, to uh, view these. And uh, they might also be make or break points that could uh, uh, turn people off to this film overall. And if that's the case for some, I, I can completely understand uh, that viewpoint. However, I do also uh, believe that uh, despite some of those uh, quite uh, maybe jarring shortcomings, uh, one can still view it, at least I can still view the sum of the total parts, even if some of those parts uh, might be uh, seen to be somewhat uh, maybe uh, unpleasant. Uh, they, this, the sum total uh, could also be seen uh, uh, simultaneously as being uh, quite effective indeed. Case in point, the train car sequence, which is itself another bravura as a suspenseful set piece, uh, again, uh, that is a truly breathtaking one. And very clever indeed in terms of perspective, sudden shots of Bobby in the corner of the frame then suddenly disappearing, frames within frames, the sudden emergence of Keith Gordon and then the foam, etc. It's, it's, uh, it's a tour de force indeed, and it leads to uh, yet more uh, confrontational aspects. Uh, and so the sum total of the parts, I think, can carry this film through. And indeed, it is a reminder, too, of uh, sort of the Brian De Palma world. And also, after all, we have to remember that uh, Brian De Palma films, uh, you know, have never been 
been politically correct. And they've always uh, carried their way in terms of uh, controversial topics uh, and inviting that controversy. And uh, if you think that that's the case for Dress to Kill, wait do you see the other films that will uh, that we will explore in the 1980s. Brian De Palma's 1980s output is uh, it's it's uh, outrageous indeed. So uh, and so uh, I look forward to talking about that with you, my dear friends. And so, uh, but that is uh, in many ways it could be seen to be par for the course in terms of of uh, the type of uh, say Brian De Palma. Uh, uh, films that we are talking about. So, uh, but that's uh, what we have here, and so I, I think it is possible to view this uh, in uh, through that perspective, through that lens, while also considering uh, some aspects of the uh, of maybe uh, a, a, a critical eye uh, when uh, that can be gleaned uh, upon watching this and indeed other films in the Brian De Palma canon. But I must say that, uh, given that, I think the uh, the Michael Caine performance is uh, quite quite impressive indeed. It is very effective and it's certainly very memorable. Uh, and that um, memorable factor is carried through all the way through to the climax of the film with the rainstorm and the darkened office of uh, Dr. Elliot and the revelation of uh, 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 the doctor and Bobby. And also this, uh, I forgot to mention too, the great interaction with uh, Dennis Franz's uh, uh, character and the police uh, detectives. That includes the character of Betty Luce. Uh, lest we forget Betty Luce and almost the, the uncanny look-alike aspect between Betty Luce on the one hand and Bobby on the other. Uh, and we also know this in terms of uh, how Bobby is actually portrayed uh, on screen, which is also a very clever touch on the part of uh, De Palma, having essentially uh, you know this this way of having uh, the establishing of the look-alike. And uh, sometimes we see a character that looks like Bobby that is pursuing or seen to be uh, observing and watching uh, an Nancy Ahn's character, but we later come to realize that this character was indeed the Betty Luce character and not Bobby. And Bobby was in fact elsewhere. This is is a very clever uh, part of the, the double that's used in uh, Brian De Palma films to trick us as a type of brilliant uh, cinema magic trick. Case in point, the one of the other famous scenes in this is the use of the Phil Donahue uh, segment, uh, which also is a part of the uh, part of the discussion of this film in the context of um, you know, maybe. Uh, 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 transsexuality and politics on the one hand and then also uh, the split screen this is a very important use of split screen probably one of the most important uses of split screen in all of Brian De Palma's cinema we have of course seen split screen used so effectively in previous films of the 1970s of De Palma recall films like Sisters uh, from the early 1970s or uh, a film a little bit later which is called uh, the Phantom of the Paradise split screen used so effectively to show two points in time simultaneously from different vantage points. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Here it's the same thing. We have two different spaces, two different places separated by this vast expanse of geography, but then we are seeing them uh, play out in real time at the same time. Dr. Elliot on the one hand and also um, Nancy Allen uh, character on the other. And we see on the one hand Nancy Allen's character being observed by this woman who looks like or reminds us of, of Bobby and we think perhaps Bobby is the one who's observing Nancy Allen on that side of the frame. At the same time we hear the messages being played back on Dr. Elliot's or Michael Caine's uh, message machine or, or hearing the voice of Bobby who we think is the voice of Bobby. And so, uh, but the, and if this is all happening at the same time because of the split screen, then how can Michael Caine be Bobby at the same time? It can't be because our eyes are telling us, or, or at least uh, we are led to believe that uh, if Bobby is existing in one part of the frame and Michael Caine is existing on the other part of the frame, then they can't be the same person, right? This is a brilliant use of split screen here, and this is the way in which I think Brian De Palma's split screen here is very similar to what we've seen in the 1970s, but also extremely different. It is similar in that it is showing two points of time, or two places at the same time, but it is different in that split screen here is used to trick us. It is a magic trick. It is used to. Uh, it is the cinematic equivalent of the red herring. It is uh, the way of showing us uh, something, diverting our attention, um, and also laying the trap uh, for 
uh, uh, for us to then be totally surprised and caught off guard when uh, the truth finally comes out at the very end. It is a brilliant, uh, a deft of uh, hand here. It is a, it's a great trick. Uh, and I applaud Brian De Palma for this uh, immensely. Uh, this use of split screen to trick us uh, in a very playful way, I think it's, uh, it's brilliant indeed, absolutely brilliant. And this type of, of use of the, the double and trickery uh, is, uh, I think, uh, present throughout the film. Uh, but I think it shows great triumphant uh, confidence with this split screen technique. Bravo, bravo for this indeed. Um, it's also, again, uh, a reminder too about how this film, Dress to Kill, is a link to the past of uh, Brian De Palma's filmography, such as the use of split screen. It links back to uses of split screen in past films, Sisters and The Phantom of the Paradise, Carrie, etc. But it also paves the way for something that is bold and inventive, something that we haven't seen before, namely in this instance, how the split screen is used to trick us, which I think is a brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, 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 technique indeed, absolutely brilliant. Um, and uh, uh, we also see other techniques that are employed so forcefully and so uh, elegantly. We've seen them in the past, uh, not just split screen, but also the use of slow motion. It's used here with such grace and such elegance and also such suspense uh, in uh, certain key moments, the elevator murder sequence, also the climax of the film where uh, the uh, identity of Bobby is revealed. Slow motion is used very effectively, um, like we have seen in other past uh, thriller films from De Palma, Carrie, The Fury, uh, etc. It, it's very effective, um, and also the almost the warped perspective that uh, teeters upon uh, uh, absurdist surreal comedy. Even I mean, I'm, I'm reminded of the scene where uh, 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 Michael Caine's character escapes uh, by killing the nurse. Uh, and we see the levels of people who are observing from the upper decks, and this has this very surreal, eerie quality, which reminds me of, of similar scenes that we saw in, say, um, Sisters uh, and uh, uh, the asylum sequences. Uh, so, uh, and how that also has almost a carnivalesque or circus quality to it. Uh, it's very similar here, and also straddles the line in terms of dream and fantasy. What is real and what is fantasy at this point? Is what we are seeing, is this really happening or is this a completely a, a kind of nightmarish dream sequence? Uh, because everything now is totally absurd and surreal all the way down to the empty shoes uh, in the corridor there or out in the door frame and also the, the razor that, that strikes uh, from the mirror of the bathroom, etc. So it all becomes a surreal technique uh, that, again, even it draws attention even further to the fact that this is a world of artifice. And if we uh, recall how we started this conversation uh, and how perhaps it's, it's possible to look at this film uh, through one interpretive lens as being a complete fabrication, a complete sort of iceberg of artifice in a, in a purposeful way, then the end of the film, I think, is also suggestive of this. Uh, but then a recalling to a type of uh, 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 nightmarish circularity and the trauma of uh, the characters here uh, in terms of the nightmare that won't go away and the trauma that won't go away. So maybe that artifice is indeed a cinematic artifice, but maybe at the same time, again, alluding to another way to look at this and other Brian De Palma films, namely, namely the interior psychology made manifest through exterior cinematic modes and grammar a la Brian De Palma cinema, we might be able then to suggest that maybe that artifice uh, of that iceberg artifice that uh, showcases a surreal, almost uh, absurdly uh, unreal aspect, um, um, a kind of a wacky, malleable aspect to uh, the, the physics of uh, the world all the way up to the sort of the, the penultimate moment of the film gives way to uh, a reminder of just how psychologically disturbed uh, these characters are. Again, the exterior mode of the psychologically disturbed nature of the, uh, the interior uh, is made manifest in these uh, uh, surreal sequences, only then to be reminded that this could be a reflection of the interior uh, psychological, uh, psychological disturbed state of uh, Nancy Ellen's character, which closes out the film. Uh, thus again, the interior uh, psychological design made manifest through exterior means. I think it's, it's uh, another great way to see Brian De Palma's uh, uh, fingerprints all over this. And this is another way, I think, I really think that this is one of the most ultimate expressions of uh, Brian De Palma's cinema and art. Warts and all, imperfections and all, uh, this is a Brian De Palma film 
In many ways, it could be the Brian De Palma film to end Brian De Palma films, but who knows? There might be other Brian De Palma films, past and future, that might try to uh, compete with that, uh, that title. Uh, and I think it's going to be a great competition indeed uh, in terms of what is the ultimate Brian De Palma film. But perhaps at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because it's possible to have more than one. Uh, and whatever your view on that question is, my dear friend, Dress to Kill is undoubtedly part of that conversation. Confidently so, triumphantly so, uh, unabashedly so, uh, unashamedly so. Uh, this is a Brian De Palma film to the max. And my gosh, what a film this is. This is the work which is Dressed to Kill. Wow. All right. So that's it as far as my brief discussion of uh, Dressed to Kill. I know there's so much more to be able to talk about this film. And I'm far from being an expert when it comes to this film. But uh, uh, I, I really admire this film. And I think it's a very disturbing work. And uh, as I say, it, it's to me one of the most ultimate expressions of Brian De Palma's art. Uh, that there is. So uh, uh, this is Dress to Kill. A uh, quick shout out to my dear friend Seth and the Double Mint Gum reference uh, and Dennis Franz. Dennis Franz and Double Mint Gum uh, go hand in hand, do they not? So thank you very much, my dear friend Seth, uh, for that wonderful reference. Uh, so, uh, But my dear friends, uh, let us continue on with the Brian De Palma film discussions if it's okay with you. But uh, So I hope to see you at the next video. Uh, but until then, my dear, dear friends, Please continue to be happy and healthy and well, and please keep on watching a lot of great, great, great films, including the works of Brian De Palma and beyond. So until the next video, my dear, dear friends, stay strong, stay safe, and cheers.